Today we discuss Atu Ratu and his lack of use and maybe how the Islanders could get him more involved in games. Plus, we have a full preview of tonight's game in Edmonton against the explosive Oilers. All that and a lot more on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. Your Locked On Islanders, your daily podcast on the New York Islanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome, everybody, to the Thursday edition of the Locked On Islanders podcast. Gil Martin, so glad you could join us today and be part of the Locked On Islanders family. And thank you for making Locked On Islanders your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. We have got a lot to discuss on today's show. We'll talk about Atu Ratu. We'll talk about tonight's game in Edmonton. But first, if there's something Islanders related on your mind, if you have a question, a comment, maybe a topic you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, feel free to send us an email, the email address lockedonislanders at gmail.com. And if you leave your first name and where you're from, we are happy to mention you on the show when we discuss whatever it is that's on your mind. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Isles. And you can follow me, Gil Martin, on Twitter at Ice Wars, NYR vs NYI. We'll keep you up to date on all the latest Islanders news, notes, and happenings. And I am live tweeting during nearly every Islanders home and road game. So join me for instant insight and analysis. And it's always great to hear from Islanders fans and talk a little Isles hockey Game time or any time. Let's start with Atu Ratu because a lot of conversations on the YouTube uh, comments, emails. We got an email from uh, our friend Tommy. Hey, Gil, it's Tommy again. I'll read this one. Do you think Atu Ratu is ready for more ice time? I believe he is, although I understand why the ice time for him is lower. I assume that Coach Lambert wants to gradually build up to it so he can develop him more, <clears throat> develop more. Do you also think he should play with Zach Parise and JG Pajot for a few shifts so he can learn from them? I know he's a center, but maybe it wouldn't hurt for Ratu or JG to hop on the wing for a couple of shifts. Thanks for the great podcast. Let's go Islanders. Tommy, thank you so much. For the email, had some comments also, again, as I said, on our YouTube page. And look, Atu Ratu is here probably only until Kyle Palmieri is healthy again. And Cal Clutterbuck and Simon Holmstrom, when these guys get healthy, I'm fairly confident that Atu Ratu goes back to Bridgeport. Is he showing the Islanders what he's capable of? I mean, what he played six minutes last night and scored his second goal. He's not getting a lot of ice time. Right now, he's playing on the fourth line. Last night, it was with Matt Martin and Ross Johnston, and he still got a goal. Pretty play. A good, aggressive forecheck to cause a turnover by Matty Marks, and then a nice little pass by Ross the boss. Don't tell me he's not capable of occasionally creating Uh, some offense because he made a really good pass on that play. But the point is this. I think that the Islanders, and this is true of all the young players when it comes to Lou Lamorello, when it comes to Lane Lambert, it certainly was even more true last year and previously under Barry Trotz. The Islanders want to bring their young players along slowly. Why? The big issue for these young players The Islanders' road to success is very system-oriented. The Islanders don't win with speed. They don't have enough on their roster. They don't win with flashy offensive plays. They'll get them occasionally, but there's not enough uh, skilled, high-end offensive players on this roster to do that. They win because they play a very specific, positionally sound system. And 
young players have to adjust to that system because if you have five skaters on the ice and one of them doesn't do their job, the whole thing can break down and you create quality scoring chances for the opposition. So that is part of the problem for the New York Islanders in that respect. They know what Atu Ratu can give them offensively. They know that on a pure talent level, he may be one of the top, let's let's be conservative and say he's one of the top four or five players skill-wise, raw skills on the roster right now. But away from the puck, is he positionally sound? Does he do the little things, back checking, picking up his man? That's the question. Now, Tommy asked about whether he could move to the wing and play with Parisi and Pajot. If anything, I think they would move Pajot to the wing if they were going to make that a line of Parise, Pajot, and Ratu. Because I think, again, with Ratu, he's a natural center. You put him in an unfamiliar or unusual position. Add to that the jump between Europe and North America, the AHL and the NHL, uh, playing against bigger, stronger, faster, more skilled and and more experienced players. They don't want to complicate it. One of the reasons they're playing them only six, you know, five, six, seven minutes a game is to simplify things for him and build his confidence. So if anything, I think they would, if they were going to do that, they keep Ratu at center and then move uh, Pajot perhaps to the wing, much like what they did with Sezikis. And again, you're complicating things a little bit, but I think in some ways that would be wise because uh, you can learn from Pajot and Parise a lot of the little things you need to do. That being said, I think Ratu can learn if he's smart and observant from what they do while he's on the bench. He doesn't need to play with them on a line necessarily to see the little things that a Zach Parise, who is a consummate professional, a J.G. Pajot, who is versatile and can be on the power play, the penalty kill, a second, you know, a top six scoring line or a bottom six checking line. I think you can learn from those guys, even if you're not on their lines, but if they are on a line together, I think Pajot moves to the wing and uh, Ratu stays at center. I would like to see Ratu get more power play time. I'm not expecting him to all of a sudden be in the top six. I'm not expecting him to play 15, 18 minutes a game like a Matthew Barzal is going to do or a Brock Nelson is going to do. That's not where he's at yet. But if you take his six, seven minutes a game and up it to 10 minutes, nine, 10 minutes a game, and put him on the second power play unit, when being exactly positionally sound defensively is a little less important because you have the extra attacker, I think that would be the next logical step. And it would boost his confidence, give him more opportunities with a little extra time and space that you don't necessarily have at even strength. I think that would be a, a good way to give Ratu more ice time, let him get some ice time with top six players on this roster and not have to worry as much about how he plays defensively because the defensive responsibilities are a little more simplified when you have that man advantage. And let's face it, the Islanders power play needs a boost badly. They got off uh, a, a power play goal by Pajot last night, but you know, if you're going to ask me, who would you rather have on the power play, uh, Josh Bailey or Atu Ratu, I wouldn't mind giving some of uh, Bailey's power play time to Atu Ratu or a few other players who have taken some time on the power play. So to me, that's sort of the middle ground. Get his numbers up another minute or two per game, primarily by playing him on the second power play unit and letting him have a chance to do more when he can do more damage offensively and not do, you know, not create as many problems defensively. To me, that's the way to do it. And we'll see whether Lane Lambert takes care of that or not. 
We have got more to get to on today's show. We're going to take a look ahead at tonight's game against the Edmonton Oilers. Always a dangerous team. We've got that and a lot more still to come on today's Locked on Islanders podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro football to college bowl season, pro and college basketball, soccer, and of course the NHL, we've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. And look, maybe you want to turn your knowledge of the New York Islanders into a chance to make some extra money. Check out the odds for tonight's game in Edmonton at betonline.net. You can head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Thanks again for making Locked On Islanders your first listen every day. Make sure you check out Locked On NHL Prospects, your daily podcast covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up to the NHL draft. Plus, NHL draft rankings, and top prospect comparisons for every team. Locked on NHL prospects available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. So the Islanders going into Edmonton now, and I'll tell you, this is a an interesting matchup. They've already met once this season, and the Islanders did skate away with a 3 nothing shutout win at UBS Arena back on November 23rd. And, you know, the Oilers have lost three of their last five games. They have also won two of their last three. Uh, So, excuse me, they've lost their last two games and three of their last five, losing at home against both Winnipeg on New Year's Eve and Seattle uh, just last night. So the Kraken, who beat the Islanders, then turned around and beat the Edmonton Oilers as well. And look, we know Edmonton's situation. They are one of the most dangerous offensive teams in the league, third right now in goals scored. But through 39 games, which is you know almost half a season, they are in fifth place in their division, mostly because their defense is only 22nd in the league. And they do struggle consistently defensively. So we have to see how this plays out. But we know some of the lines and the way it works. Look, let's start with the injuries. We know three players who are on IR right now. Oscar Clefbaum, Mike Smith, the goalie, who may not return ever to the NHL, and Evander Kane. Those are three players who are all on the IR. But... We also know how skilled this team is. Their power play right now, first in the league, a 32.1% success rate. The PK, however, 26th. So again, just like Vancouver uh, a couple of nights ago on Tuesday, they had the the worst penalty kill in the league. Edmonton, not much better, 72.9% kill rate, 26th in the league. The Islanders, it's going to be critical that they take advantage of the Oilers' struggling PK and not give that devastating power play any opportunities because one out of every three times they get an extra attacker, the Oilers do score. And look, you have two players right now who are neck and neck fighting for that power play goal lead on the team, Connor McDavid. 14 goals, 33 on the season, 14 of them coming on the power play. And Leon Dreisaitl, 13 of his 21 goals have come on the power play. And McDavid is just so dangerous. 37 of his 73 points have come with the extra attacker. Uh, Tyson Barry has 17 power play assists. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, 18 this is a dangerous team. And, and don't overlook Zach Hyman, who has nine power play goals. He has 17 on the year, nine coming with the extra attacker. The goaltending duo, you have Stuart Skinner, 
who has started 23 games, a 914 save percentage, a 288 goals against average, and then Jack Campbell, who is only 87 and 1 with an 877 save percentage and a rather disappointing 3.80 goals against average. Now, uh, again, uh, Skinner got most of the work against Seattle, played the first 36 almost minutes and gave up all four goals before being replaced by Campbell. So we have to see what the uh, Oilers coaching staff does when it comes to uh, who they're going to play in goal. Let's go over the line combinations. Connor McDavid, Zach Hyman, and Yessi uh, Poyavari. That's the top line. Dreisaitl, Warren Fogle, and Kyler Yamamoto is the second line. When you have Ryan Nugent Hopkins as your third line center, that tells you how deep and talented offensively this Oilers team is. He has Matthias Janmark to his left, Clint Coaston to his right, and then Ryan McLeod, Dylan Holloway, and Derek Ryan make up the fourth line. The defensive pairings, Cody Ceci, Darnell Nurse, a very talented top pairing, Brett Kulak and Tyson Barry, again, good second pairing, and then Philip Broberg and Evan Bouchard are the third pair. The power play, which, as we mentioned, super dangerous. Hyman, Nugent Hopkins, and Dreisaitl up front. McDavid goes back to the one point, Barry to the other, and the second unit, Holloway, Pulivari, and Yamamoto with Nurse and Bouchard on the points. This is not a team you want to trifle with. Now, the Islanders did indeed shut them out, and slowing down this team in the neutral zone is key, and just you can't give them time and space, and you can't give them high-quality chances. You've got to limit rebounds, deflections, clear you got to make sure, you know, look, the Islanders now have back-to-back -back games. You know Sorokin's going to play one, Varlamov is going to play the other. I would assume Sorokin goes tonight, Varley goes uh, on Friday in Calgary, but we have to wait and see what Lane Lambert decides to do about that. To me, uh, either way, you need a great game from your goalie and your defense core can't be the only ones out there playing good defensively. Your forwards have to back check. And, you know, if ever there was a game where you would want Cal Clutterbuck back, if ever there was a game where you wanted a, a good defensive forward in the lineup, Edmonton is probably the team you want to see. It is a challenge to win on the road in Edmonton. Not an easy assignment, to say the least. But hopefully the Islanders will indeed be equal to the task. And uh, again, it's a challenge. It is a challenge for this team to get the job done. And hopefully they will be equal to that challenge. And, you know, you don't want to get into a shootout with this team. But what you do want to do is... You want to take advantage of their weakness defensively without giving up too many quality scoring chances because, boy, they are an explosive offense. The Islanders did it once before, but that was at UBS Arena. Let's see if they can do it again tonight in Edmonton. We have got more to discuss on today's episode. We have our Islanders birthday of the day a player who will take you all the way back to the early days of the Islanders franchise, plus uh, some thoughts about the Islanders' slow starts this year. We're going to talk about that and a whole lot more still to come on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Look, if you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you've got to get a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal was to eat a little healthier this year, but if you're like me and you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste, man, I have got just the thing for you. You got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious, you won't think they're good for you. They're perfect for your New Year's resolution. And what makes Built Bars so good? 
Well, for starters, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Bilt does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better, they're healthy. Only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar per bar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can also get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk into the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. And if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later. So again. Head on over to built.com or check out those locations to get built bar for yourself. Time now for our Islanders birthday of the day. And tomorrow, Friday, will be the 77th birthday of former Islanders forward Bob Cook. The Sudbury, Ontario native made his NHL debut in 1970 with the Vancouver Canucks played two games for them there, then played for the Red Wings for part of the 72-73 season before joining the Islanders for 33 games in their inaugural season. Eight goals and 14 points in those games and was only a minus 10, which for the first year Islanders is pretty impressive. Was with the Islanders again early in the 73-74 season, two goals, three points in 22 games, then played a couple of games for the Minnesota Minnesota North Stars before finishing his career in the minor leagues. Played senior hockey in 75-76 before officially hanging up his skates. Amazingly, uh, Bob Cook only played 72 career NHL games, 13 goals, 22 points, and 22 penalty minutes. Never did make a playoff appearance. But when you look at his best game as an Islander, there's no debating it. It was March 3rd, 1973 at the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum when it was the new barn, not the old barn, and the Vancouver Canucks of all teams coming in to town. Ed Dyke, the goalie for Vancouver, battling Billy Smith for the Islanders. And our Islanders' birthday of the day, Bob Cook got things started just 4.08 into the game, his seventh from Dave Hudson and Terry Crisp. Isles up early, one to nothing. Don Lever ties it for the Canucks, his 11th from Rich Lemieux and Bobby Lalonde just 13 seconds later. Two minutes after the Lever goal, though, Craig Cameron makes it two to one Isles, his 16th from the captain, Eddie Westfall and Brian Spinner Spencer. Then with thir- at the 13.52 mark, Bob Cook, his eighth. From Brian Lefley and Dave Hudson, Isles up three to one after one, already two goals for our Islanders' birthday of the day, Bob Cook. Craig Cameron scores his second of the game, 17th of the year, just a minute 11 into the second period. Lauren Henning and Bill Mickelson with the assist. And then at the 303 mark of period two, Bob Cook finishes off his hat trick, his ninth of the year. Dave Hudson, the only assist, Isles up 5 1. Billy Harris makes it 6-1 from Jermaine Gagnon and Ralph Stewart at 11:43, And then late in the period with Jocelyn Gavermont off for hooking, Dave Hudson on the power play. His 10th from Eddie Westfall and Jermaine Gagnon. Islanders up 7-1 after 40 minutes. Goals by Ralph Stewart and a power play goal by Ed Westfall. Add to the Islanders lead, Andre Boudrias and Bobby Schmatz score for Vancouver in the third. Islanders coast to a 9-3 lead. Ed Dyke replaced by Dunk Wilson for Bob Cook. Three goals. He was a plus two, had four shots on goal and scored on three of them. Dave Hudson, a goal and five points in this game. Two goals for Craig Cameron, three assists for Jermaine Gagnon. But boy, Bob Cook, for a player who only had 13 goals in his career, three of them came in this game against the Canucks. So Bob Cook, whose birthday is Friday, he is our Islanders' birthday of the day.
I wanted to talk a little bit about these slow starts. And they have hurt the Islanders all year. It is something that Lane Lambert is going to have to figure out. And we're going to talk about it more uh, on a future episode. I'm going to devote a whole segment to it. But right now, you would think that a veteran team like the Islanders wouldn't need the extra motivation, would have the experience and the knowledge that, hey, we can, you know, we know faceoff is at 7 or whatever time it is. We have to be ready. The fact that this team hasn't straightened it out yet is becoming a growing concern for me because you can't afford <clears throat> to give up the first goal all the time to waste a period when you're not playing well, you've got to do a better job and this team better figure it out. We'll break more of it down probably next week, but it, it is getting to me right now how this team is struggling in first periods and just giving away periods, which you can't afford to do in the National Hockey League. Thanks for making Locked On Islanders your first listen today for your second listen, checked out Locked On NHL Prospects, your daily podcast covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up to the NHL draft. Locked On NHL Prospects available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. That's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Islanders podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with our key takeaways from uh, the game against the Oilers. Plus, we will uh, preview... Friday's game against Calgary, which is the only game this weekend before the Islanders return home Tuesday to face the Dallas Stars. So we will uh, break down that game and preview it for you and hopefully have some good news about what happened in Edmonton. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. And of course, let's go Islanders.